2008 saw a turning point in social history. For the first time, young people under 16 were outnumbered by those over 65. As this demographic shift continues, it is likely to have profound consequences for the way in which generations interact. The relationship between younger and older people is not always easy. Young people can be written off too quickly by adults, and conversely, older people are often seen as out of touch by today's youth. The time for change has come. As the previous government set out a strategy for change, the disparity between the ages became all too apparent. The generation gap is the, not gulf, but there's a, there's a gap between the way young people live their lives and the forces and things that impact on that and the drivers and, and the, the inform the, where they get their information from and the information they use to make decisions. And the same for older people. I guess the generation gap could be interpreted as one generation having no relationship or interaction with another generation. So maybe a 15-year-old today having no interaction with a 70-year-old. The younger people are much more um, IT literate and a lot of their social life is take, taking place with the use of the internet. Old, old people over 50 and older people, you know, still socialising in the way they did when they were young. What makes you fulfilled in your society um, and fulfilled in your community um, are things that probably haven't changed. You know, uh, do you feel you're, you're part of a group? Do you enjoy real life? Do you know where you can get help if you wanted it? Do you know who lives next door? Those are fundamental things that aren't reliant on technology. The communities have not deliberately shunned each other. It's just that some of the changes that we've seen in the structures in communities and, and stuff like that has meant that people drift away. So I think the generation gap is more obvious today and it's become a cause of concern. The news has its role too, especially with populist reporting. I, I think the media needs to help us more with, the, with addressing the generation gap and creating positive um, role models for older and younger people. Often in society, young people are seen as bad and a problem and uh, feral. And older people are seen as, well, a problem. They're living long and they're a cost. And they're often two groups that are quite marginalised and whose experience and can be very, have major impact, social exclusion, and can have big impact on their lives. Part of this marginalisation may stem from innate attitudes to different age groups. Yeah, the majority of young's pretty good, but you know, some little idiots around the world, isn't there? I mean, only last week all these trees had Christmas lights on them. Mm -hmm. I mean, and uh, it was all 450 quid worth of just ripped around, like, you know? Whether that was younger ones or somebody in the drink, you don't know, do you? My opinion of older people is they are very important because they're always, always right. Um, are sometimes forgotten about, which we they um, brought us up and showed us what to do, and then we forget about them. So, yeah. Uh, well, I've sort of tried to think about what it'd be like if I was their age. I mean, you see them hanging around here, and they're just doing exactly the same stuff that I did 35 years ago or something, hanging around on street corners and breaking things. That's just part of being young. Then you grow out of it. Nothing wrong with them. They are who they are, really. Like, nothing wrong with all the people, I get on with them easily. When I was little, we had well, we had to make our own fun when I was little. But today, I mean, the children have got everything, haven't they? Mm -hmm. They've got computers and everything. So I don't feel sorry for them. And I honestly believe that there isn't much for young people to do in at this present time. But I think young people and old people can work together. 
and that's what should happen. If there was more happy married couples, there would be a lot more happy youngsters running the streets instead of youngsters now that's almost like wild animals because um, they've got nobody to turn to to point them in the right direction. For some, first-hand experiences have tainted their perceptions irreparably. Having been affected by young criminals, William Riddock was forced to reassess his situation. A certain situation occurred where an old gentleman got beaten up walking through the park at... Unfortunately, he was grandfather of an infamous family. And that, because another family got the blame of it, then that just, if I could say it, all hell broke loose, really, at the end of the day. What do you do? The best thing you can do is not to, not, if you don't get involved, you stay in and you close your door. So you're better off walking away, walking away and leaving them to it. When we attempt to discuss the details of his experience, there is a change in mood. Can you turn that off and I'll answer that question? you got to turn it off before I can answer the question. <laughs> I, I, seriously, seriously, I'll tell you why. Okay. Off camera, Bill reveals the names of two notorious criminal families and a litany of assaults, damage and drugs-related crime that took place on his doorstep, often perpetrated by teenage children. But I just came to the stage where... It was a case of I didn't want to live an enclosed life. So therefore, I thought the best thing I could do was to actually move to another area and semi-start again. Do I regret it? Yes, I do. I miss a lot of stuff about it. I had 22 brilliant years there. You've got to make sensible choices for your own safety. I stay well away from it now. At the other end of the spectrum, Lucy Catherine has suffered prejudices and patronage from adults in the health service. I think it's just been really difficult because sometimes I don't think they're very understanding in regards to, like, um, like for instance, obviously, if, you're really, if your anxiety is really high, they assume that you've got to be on something, whereas in, it could just be how you're feeling that day. Because I know a few times I've, you know, really, when I've come away, I've really, like, annoyed with what they've said. And because I don't have the confidence to say to them, you know, that's how I feel. Um, you know, you don't really get anywhere and you still sort of hold a grudge about it. Whereas, you know, I think if you're a bit older, you can stand up for yourself and they don't treat you like you're a child as such. And obviously they accuse me of taking drugs and, you know. But I think once you've been, like, you know, not being able to trust one person, it is hard to find, you know, the trust in other people as well, so. Given these sentiments, efforts to unite the generations risk becoming intrusive. There is no requirement or mandate for anyone to get involved with other people if they don't want to. But... We've seen over the last few years the way that individual interest and more specialist interest has taken communities in a particular way and that has now been identified as causing fractures in communities and, and, and a lack of communication. It's not about forcing people to come together, it's about around trying to find common ground between two groups that are often have a lot of stigma attached to them and a lot of judgments made of them and how they can come together for whichever purpose, but it's both, it's for mutual benefit and also fun. In 2010, the then Department for Children, Schools and Families sought to bridge the divide by developing a national scheme to promote intergenerational principles. With £5.5 million of funding, the programme became known as Generations Together. In Somerset, the voluntary and community sector formed a partnership to deliver the project managed by the charity CHIPS. Company of Voices is 11 partner organisations in Somerset, voluntary sector organisations who have developed a number of different projects and ideas in order to recruit younger and older people for intergenerational practice. 
The Company of Voices is a, a brand, if you like, that helped us to unite a whole range of voluntary sector and statutory sector partners under one vision and, and one piece of project work. One way of looking at it is where younger people, often under the age of 25, and 12 to 25, which is quite a different age group, and older people, often over the age of 50, which you might think is quite a young older person, um, come together, again, for, the, for mutual benefit, for a, a purpose. So we've worked together to plan and deliver an activity which collectively we hope will support some change around bringing generations together and around challenging negative perceptions and also celebrating you know, what's positive. British Red Cross has been involved from inception, holding sessions for hand and neck massage across the county. Well I think first they've got, most of them will have a new skill, um, but along with that skill will come the memory, the experience of you know, who was around them when they learnt it and who, perhaps even who taught them that. That's been very positive, uh, looking about how we work, how we engage our volunteers and also um, our own criteria at the moment is looking about how we are going to engage more young people given that we have such a predominantly older image. I think it's great. I really enjoyed the fact that, you know, something so simple and uh, so easy to do can be so helpful to people. Um, and they're always so grateful for our help. Um, and they just feel so much more relaxed afterwards. And I think the physical contact as well is a really big, big thing. Um, and especially for older people who sometimes, who live in smaller communities and can sometimes feel quite detached. Yeah, it's been really, really good. And my confidence in talking to people is um, a lot better than it used to be. I used to be like, if I had to give someone a son, thought of having to like stand on my own, someone that I don't know would be like really, really awkward. But now, just fine. I think it gets people together. People in the hall are enjoying themselves, and they sit and they have a cup of tea, where they will be at home, maybe on their own. So if you can get people together and get a get a nearly a free massage, it's good. It certainly made a difference to my organisation insofar as um, I've been given a space to go between services and perhaps. Um, that engenders some more collaborative work between services that have traditionally stuck just to their, their own service. So that's been very positive. Despite joining Company of Voices belatedly, Kerrymore Environmental Centre has been equally active, building on its established volunteer group. Generations Together I think is a really interesting project. I think in the voluntary sector we're often guilty of pigeonholing people into different groups. I know a lot of the work we do will work with young people and will work with older people um, and we don't deliberately look to bring the two groups together so I think it's a really new and exciting opportunity for us. Having only been involved with the project for a short while, I can see some differences already with the people that we brought in. We ran a workshop recently on site doing some willow working and we brought in some young people who've been involved with the centre for a very long time. They've been coming here for four or five years, um, every month regularly, and they are now working with people that they wouldn't have worked with before and it's given them an opportunity to, to share knowledge and experiences with new people and with, with, with people from a different generation that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Young people have got lots of skills that us older people find really difficult, you know, especially things like computing and technical things like that, that they pick up just like that and for us it's really difficult. So, yeah, I think we could learn a lot. I don't interact with people of that age normally and it's really nice, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, we did the house and like built on until now it's like wow.
Yeah. 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 yeah, and also sort of sharing ideas and skills and everything like develop. It's been good to work with the people getting used to it. And I think in terms of their development and their self-confidence, it's something that they can talk about with, with pride and enthusiasm um, and giving them the opportunity to do that that they wouldn't have had otherwise. The project today was to have liaison with this particular school and to um, let those kids come here and be with people 60 years their senior on the whole, or some, some uh, t one or two here are near 90 years old, and uh, they can then ask, they, the kids can ask the questions about something they didn't live through themselves, because we made it the subject for them to write about in our annual magazine. Playing its part in the project, VISTA has helped local schools and Stroke Association clubs share wartime memories. I think it's, 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 hugely, it's hugely relevant um, uh, and kind of linked um, to the idea of big society. And I think it's, it's um, uh, you know, any project that brings together older and, and younger people has an, um, uh, a very special quality um, to it. So it's, it's, it's hugely important and at a time when younger and older people are kind of disconnected and societies actually, in fact communities are disconnected, uh, it's very, very important. So I was sitting in a cafe one day in Bridgewater writing some notes and this old lady came in and she came to sit with me at the table and she started to talk to me about her childhood. One day the road had been tarmacked and they couldn't get through so the workmen actually threw these small children from workmen to workmen to get them down to the end of the road and how when she went home her mother laughed and I thought that story now would have such a resonance wouldn't it? People would be so much concerned about it. Who was the man? What did he do? What did he? And so so it's 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 um you know all these kind of interactions these stories all within that 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 larger context. I think the project is 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 dynamic so I think it doesn't just happen when when we're doing the work I think it's not just about when we bring the older and younger people together I think outside of that um, there are um, sort of partnerships uh, and affiliations sort of coming together. So I've absolutely loved it um, we've learned I've learned so many things it's incredible yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun and I hope to learn a bit more about it soon. I wish for every school to have this, so hopefully one day we can make that happen. It's been quite different, but in a good way, because we've been learning about, obviously, their takes on their younger life, and they've been learning about what we're like now, because obviously they didn't have all the technology we have. Um, well, like Harvey said, it's been good and different because the normal school day is good and educational, but doing something else is good. Um, and it's just nice listening to other people's stories and their perspective of their lives. And, and so I think it's important everywhere for children to relate to other generations, and thus the wisdom of the ages can be passed on. Even with the best intentions, there come inevitable challenges. Some surface as early as the planning stage. So the project brief is, is it's not a project that I would have designed, so I inherited it. Um, and I tend to be a bit, I'm a bit kind of a mixture of, of sort of being um, sort of research-based or kind of shaped by evidence and research and then, and then going out and seeing what people want and trying to bring the two together. And, and I haven't really been able to do that. Probably the biggest overall challenge was um, not being there right at the beginning to be able to put the, the sort of project plan together myself. People don't recognise what you're trying to do. It hasn't been done before. These are sort of 
things you're bound to encounter and that just means take, getting it off the ground and getting it rolling is it's a lot of energy and work to try and you know get that enthusiasm and get it started and get people to understand what it is that you're you're trying to deliver the time the timeline's been a challenge man time and um our time if you're the sole person delivering that project the biggest challenge for us in the project is recruiting the volunteers there's always somebody that phones up and says but i'm only 47 and it sounds really good and i'd like to take part and you're turning them away and I think at times the paperwork, but not hugely actually. I mean, I think it's about how how the the we we have to collect we have to collect data. But what I will do is 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 tend to I know the questions in my head, so I you know I'll ask people the questions rather than just give out a piece of paper. Recruiting has its own concerns too. There are people who have taken part in Company of Voices activities elsewhere and don't realise they're all part of the same project. So when we're trying to recruit new volunteers, um, because the organisation is new to them and the venue is new to them, and you ask them questions on the phone and have you taken part in any of these before, oh no, because they haven't been here before. But actually then when it comes, you find that you're duplicating volunteers. There's a lot of factors to consider, um, be it stereotypes of each group, um, how they're often perceived and shown negatively within the press, how younger and older people are used to interacting, or maybe not used to interacting at all, and it's, this is a whole new thing. How maybe different cultural backgrounds mean you're used to relating to an older person in a certain way. Maybe challenge some of your own perceptions around stereotypes of younger and older people. That could be positive, I mean, sometimes there's a stereotype of all older people are friendly. Well, not always. <laughs> Um, that all older people have wisdom we want people to share from. Or well, what if they're a member of an extreme party who, pr who promotes hate principles? So I think it's even those little things that sometimes we jump into this thinking it's really going to be a lovely and nice thing, which it can be, but that can cause problems. Another consideration is the potential for repeat applicants, reducing opportunities for new volunteers. I think there's always a risk that we, we're working with the converted, but let's use that to our advantage and um, sh you know, lead the way. I think there's a danger that it could be the usual suspects. It would be very easy for us to look at the project and think, OK, we'll go and work with this group and we'll go and work with that group because we know we've got the relationships with them. The restricted time um, and the you know, numbers that we need to get has a, meant that we just do go for these targets. We're a bit target-driven rather than going for perhaps where there was the most need. No, I don't think it is actually, because I've, been, um, I've, I've um, got about 10 years experience of working in, in Somerset on, in, in, in deprived areas with people that usually takes a lot of persuasion to get them involved in things. But because I've built up relationships with those people, they don't usually volunteer. But they are there and you can start with the e people who are easy to reach and then move on, hopefully, um, to getting to the more vulnerable or the more difficult to reach. Like all ventures of this scale, there is always room for improvement. I think it could be improved by um, more collaborative working between the organisations that are delivering it. Um, we're all trying to do the same thing, going to the same people. Because I think one of the things is that you've had lots of different settings with different workers doing things. And in some settings it would have worked very well, and in others it won't have worked so well. And it's a bit hard to find out perhaps how that's happened. So I think it's important to, to, to ask people about the working styles, about look at sort of the ethos of the organisation, who they've worked in partnership with, and maybe try and pull some themes out of it. That might be useful. The main thing that would have improved my life in delivering this would be a more accessible paperwork. It really has been um, still trying to figure out how we can do this sensitively, um, how it's not going to interfere with you know, the activities that we're hosting. I think with a project of this scale, it's difficult to see how you'd overcome that, but it is, it is time consuming. And for us, an environmental organisation, it's also very paper heavy as well. As more and more activities are delivered, it is clear there is a raft of benefits, ranging from new partnerships and shared practice to more fundamental matters. The best thing that's come out of it, being honest, is some funding to develop work that we wouldn't have have done otherwise. Um, 
in the voluntary sector, sadly, we're forever looking for where the next set of funding is coming from. Learning what other organisations do and what capacity they have to deliver what they're doing. And it's, that's been fantastic. That really has. Well, just as much as well, it is a pilot programme to say, well, we wouldn't do that again. We, we, we'd, we'd say maybe consider this, consider that, think about these things. And it's about the shared learning maybe yeah, looking at a wider context and saying well if I involve these people or these people from these different areas that I hadn't first considered how much added value is that going to bring to the project. The other outcome has to be about the people that take part so we're really hoping that through the um, approach to project delivery, the, the induction and the support we give the volunteers, younger and older, they're going to have a really positive experience. You could have outcomes of increased confidence, new skills, new relationships, increased volunteering, social activism. For the volunteers involved, um, those who've had a really good experience, um, perhaps a change of, you know, change of ideas. There has been a real significant outcome in Somerset through the Company of Voices partnership. And I think what's mostly valued is the partnership have been able to be, be part of something bigger and draw on each other's experience. I would hope that certainly for us at the centre, some of the relationships that have developed during the project would continue. A vital part of the process is ensuring intergenerational practice is embedded in future work. It's all about having a clear model and that's not, it must be done this way, rather here's multiple approaches to things in an area. A clear evaluation process, what worked and what didn't, and quite a structured process where I think learning is quite clear. And I think it's about really um, sharing um, the knowledge and the issues with the groups that you're working with so that you ask them that question. How can you, how could you keep this going? How could you embed intergenerational practice into your setting? And that's the trick about working with the existing groups and the people who are there who will realise the benefit of this and then say, right, we will carry on doing this not because there's this project encouraging and supporting us to do it, because we've realised that we can do it, we've got the skills and the ability and the confidence, and we know it's a good thing to do. However, perhaps most important, is a thorough evaluation of the project. There's, al there's always a danger with relatively short-term funded projects, um, that there's a lot of good stuff goes on, and then it stops and people look back and go, oh, that was really good, we did some really good stuff. What we need to be able to do constantly is point out how the the legacy of that really good stuff is still evidenced and that will be difficult. So it's, it's all there and I think it's all there in what a lot of the organisations are already working towards anyway but it's just capturing that specifically that's been really positive. I think it's really important um, that uh, the findings of this project don't just get found. It's really showcasing how intergenerational practice can be taken forward in different areas. I think that's one of the really important things, isn't it, that, that we all learn from this, is there's so much learning in projects like this. It's not just about a one approach fits all. It can inform um, and help to develop future projects. Without doubt, Generations Together is proving an ambitious endeavour, but one galvanised by an increased sense of community. As the project continues to grow nationwide, it has become apparent there is no silver bullet for attaining intergenerational cohesion. There are profound differences between the ages, but despite its immutable nature, the generation gap is narrower than ever.